Okay, so welcome to the inaugural webinar of the Nicholas Institute's Water Policy Programs webinar series. And today we have a presentation about the water market in California from Westwater Research. So my name is Lucas Stevens. I'm a policy associate at the Nicholas Institute at Duke, and I'll be your host for our webinar today. In this series, we hope to have presentations and discussions about some of the most important water policy issues across the country and how water data informs the management decisions and problem solving that lies behind these policy questions. So we're starting today with a presentation by Bryce, Bryce McAteer and Brian David from Westwater Research. Uh, and their presentation is about California's water market and the NQH2O index, which provides a weekly snapshot of California water prices. So the index is a reliable informational tool that people can use to understand current prices in California's water market. In addition, our presenters will talk about new futures contracts that settle against the index, and that can be used to offset financial risks of volatility in the water market, resulting from volatility in hydrologic conditions. And we are certainly entering a new territory when it comes to water in California and the Southwest in general. Scientists have recently used records of tree rings to conclude that the current drought is likely more severe than any in the past 1,200 years. Uh, so it should be no surprise that the water market is seeing the kind of innovation that Westwater is developing. So I'll hand it over to Bryce and Brian in just a minute. But first, I want to go over some housekeeping details. We are recording the webinar today, and the recording and the presentation slides will be available soon as links on our website. So if you have to leave early for any reason or wish to share the presentation with friends and colleagues, it will be available for you to do so. Following the presentation, we'll have a couple of minutes for Bryce and Brian to answer your questions. And so you can submit these at any time into the Q&A box, and I will read them out and moderate the discussion at the end of the presentation. If you have any administrative issues, for example, if the audio or the video is not working for you, um, feel free to put these in the chat box and we'll try to get those fixed as soon as possible. All right, and with that, I'm going to end my slideshow and turn it over to Bryce and Brian. Take it away, guys. Thanks so much, Lucas. Uh, and good morning or good afternoon, all depending on what time zone you're tuning in from. Uh, my name is Bryce McAteer. I'm with Westwater Research, a senior associate with the firm, and have been here uh, in our California office for just about three years now. Uh, joining me today is Brian David from our Colorado office. Um, we are very excited to talk to you today about California's water market, the new NQH2O uh, water price index, as well as the new water futures contracts, which settle against that index. Um, Water is a fascinating topic, and particularly out west here in the western United States, uh, we're seeing growing competition for scarce resources and the continuing impact of more volatile water supply conditions uh, and the increasing severity of drought. And so uh, California's water market is a robust tool that many water users have uh, participated in um, in the past to help them uh, manage their water supply needs and challenges, and uh, the NQH2O uh, index, as well as the futures, are new tools that water market participants can use to help them navigate the water market and manage price risks. Um, a little bit about myself, uh, as I mentioned, I've been with Westwater Research for the past three years now. Uh, prior to that, I also worked in the public sector, as well as the nonprofit sector, and I have the pleasure of saying I'm an uh, alum of Duke and also a former employee of the Duke Nicholas Institute. Um, and that's probably enough about me, Brian, uh, uh, allow you to introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Bryce. I am also uh, an alumnus of uh, the Duke Nicholas School, um, graduated uh, in 2020, and uh, joined Westwater in our Colorado office in Fort Collins a little over a year ago. Uh, previously was working for a sustainable investment company uh, focusing on solutions to clean water drinking access uh, for underserved communities. Um, and it's a pleasure to be talking with everyone today. Thanks, Brian. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen here and we can get started with our presentation. Um, so let's see here. Brian, can you give me a thumbs up? Are you seeing what we need to see? 
All right. Well, again, thank you all for your time. Uh, as mentioned, this presentation here briefly describes California's water spot market, the NQH2O California Water Price Index, and the new water futures, which settle against that in index and provide a new financial risk management tool for participants in the water market. <clears throat> As we go through this uh, presentation, first we'll briefly uh, introduce Westwater Research, our firm, then describe the water market, the index and the futures, uh, and then conclude with an opportunity for, for Q&A. <clears throat> so a little bit about Westwater Research and our firm. Uh, Westwater Research is an economic consulting firm that specializes in water market research, pricing, trading, resource management, and policy advising. Uh, We've been in business now for over 20 years, and we have offices across the Western United States, including here in Sacramento, California, Vancouver, Washington, Boise, Idaho, Fort Collins, Colorado, uh, and Phoenix, Arizona. We support clients, uh, including public agencies, nonprofit groups, as well as private clients across the Western United States primarily, uh, but as well as in some places in the East Coast. Um, our specialties include water rights and water uh, resource valuations, uh, cost benefit analyses, economic research and policy analyses. And we've supported everything from large federally funded water storage projects to innovative uh, nonprofit environmental group programs uh, to support in-stream flows and uh, and environmental objectives. At the end of the day, I like to say that we operate at the, inter at the nexus of water and value and help folks create innovative solutions to the water supply challenges. <clears throat> now, as we start off the presentation, I thought it would be helpful for uh, viewers and attendees to um, get a little bit of an introduction to California's physical water transfer market. As I mentioned today, we're gonna to be discussing the water market, particularly here in California, as well as new tools that have been developed for water market participants uh, to both participate in that market in a more informed manner, as well as manage uh, the price risk volatility associated with that market. But before we get into those new tools, I think it's helpful to describe California's water market in general uh, and get folks up to speed on what that is and uh, current demand drivers that are influencing uh, trends and conditions in the market. So I think the first thing that I wanna start off with is just describing participation in California's water market. Um, and some of you may be familiar, but the, the, Cal the California water market and water transfers uh, are a commonly used tool by municipal entities, nonprofit groups, environmental users, uh, as well as agricultural users to help them manage through their water supply challenges and uh, voluntarily share available water supplies amongst each other uh, in, in undercompensated conditions. And so I think it's important to note that you know, the water market is not a new thing here in California uh, because of the major river systems and the uh, nexus of conveyance systems, water users across the state are able to move, transfer, buy, sell, and exchange water supplies. And often we see uh, an influx of that activity during dry years as folks are managing against uh, hardened demands and, uh, and lower supplies. Uh, over time, as we've uh, observed and tracked California's water market, we've seen that agricultural buyers are beginning to increasingly dominate California's spot market. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One, uh, in the early 2000s, there was a good amount of funding for environmental entities, groups, and uh, in particular, federal wildlife refuges to acquire water on the spot market. Um, that funding since about 2010 has declined. And so we've seen less participation by environmental entities. And then for municipal entities, the, their participation in the spot market has declined, although we do see spikes in activity during dry years, but that's primarily because uh, municipal entities are a bit, uh, more well-funded than agricultural entities and oftentimes are diversifying their water supply portfolios, developing new storage, investing in recycling, or essentially investing in uh, higher capital cost uh, water resource infrastructure that allows them to have uh, firm supplies and managed through droughts, whereas the agricultural users are a bit more prone to the ebbs and flows of California's uh, annual hydrology and the volatility of that hydrology. <clears throat> now there's a few key market drivers that influence trading activity in California's market. Uh, the first I wanna to touch on is hydrology. Uh, California has really volatile hydrology. We have wet years, we have dry years. There's not really a lot of average years in California. And in California, we uniquely have both a large state water project that conveys surface water to water users, as well as a large federal project that conveys surface water to water users. 
Now, since 2000, both of those major water supply systems have become less reliable, both because of shifts in hydrology, where it's become uh, moderately drier, as well as new environmental regulations and policies, uh, which add different constraints and operating rules uh, that influence the allocations that those projects can make to their individual contractors. So as you can see from, from 2000 to today, the water supply reliability has declined. In addition, the volatility uh, for those two major projects have be, or the supplies have become more volatile for those two projects. As a result of that, we're starting to see water users enter the market in all year types to maximize availability, um, not just in dry years, which historically was when we saw peak activity. <clears throat> Another key driver in California's water market is shifting agriculture. Uh, since 2010, we've seen uh, just under a million acres of new permanent crop plantings go into production in the heartland of California's Central Valley, including the Sacramento Valley and the San Joaquin Valley. As a result of that, California has seen an increase in inflexible and long-term irrigation demands. Um, and as a result of that, there's heightened competition and heightened demand, particularly in dry years for scarce resources, which has been driving up both trading activity and prices. Um, these nut and tree crops continue the trend of hardening statewide water demand, uh, which, is, which is also complemented by a hardening of, uh, of municipal demands. Uh, this information here at the chart is drawn from California's uh, urban water management plans. Every five years, the state asks all urban water purveyors of a certain size to submit their plans for uh, water supply management, as well as their projections for growth and demand. And based off of those plans, uh, California is projected to grow by both 3.5 million people by 2040 and increase its overall urban water demand by about 1.4 million acre feet by 2040. Now these municipal agencies, again, uh, are generally pursuing new ways to short their reliability, including uh, capital intensive projects such as groundwater banking, storage, desalination, recycling, but also we've seen more activity in the spot market in dry years. Uh, but generally speaking, municipal agencies are focused on long-term reliability through multi-year agreements or uh, significant capital investments, which has limited their participation in, in the uh, spot market. <clears throat> now, another major policy uh, uh, update that has occurred in California is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Some of you may be familiar with this act, but in 2014, the state of California um, authored the, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which essentially requires that priority groundwater basins across California uh, achieve so-called sustainability by 2040 or 2042, depending on priority. The majority of the basins uh, that are included in the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, are in the agricultural heartlands of the state, as well as uh, in the major municipal areas of the state. <clears throat> as a result of ongoing groundwater use in California and a lack of regulatory activity or limits on groundwater use, um, California is estimated to have uh, about a, an average annual deficit of 2 million acre feet uh, as a result of groundwater overpumping in some of its key aquifer systems. Local groundwater sustainability agencies now have been tasked with um, implementing sustainability plans, which include both supply augmentation as well as demand reduction uh, programs. And as a result of that, GSAs as well as individual water users are beginning to enter the market in all year types to offset uh, groundwater pumping restrictions in some areas, primarily in the Sacramento Valley and the San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> Now, we've talked a lot about market activity. We've talked a lot about uh, demand drivers and influences the market. So now I want to touch on spot market prices and the actual pricing of water in, in California spot market. Now, as you can see here, we have pricing information from 1990 through about 2021. Um, and uh, over time, we've seen average prices in the market systematically increase irrespective of water year type. However, you'll also note that as a result of uh, competing supply and demand conditions, the, variab the variability between wet and dry prices is also uh, increasing. We see significant sp spikes in both prices as well as volatility uh, in our dry years. And you can see that most recent uh, dry year periods from 2013 through 2015, as well as from 2020 through 2021, have seen significant spikes um, uh, relative to uh, prior dry year periods where maximum prices have reached around $2,000 or higher in some market areas. 
Now, price variability is really challenging for water users to budget for and also makes it challenging for water users, whether they be municipal agencies or agricultural users, uh, to maintain stable year-to-year -year cash flows. And so managing for this pricing risk is uh, becoming increasingly challenging, uh, which is what brings us to the new tools that we'll, we'll be discussing here today. <clears throat> Now, I also wanted to just bring up today's drought, as many of you are aware, and as Lucas mentioned, uh, we're currently in another dry spell here in California, and we're seeing historically low allocations in all of our water systems. Um, the chart on the right is the U.S. Drought Monitor as of mid-July and shows uh, the, the changing drought conditions in the state from 2019, which was a relatively wet year, through today in 2022, which is the third dry year and uh, in a historically dry cycle. And so across California, water users are contending with low supply allocations. You can see there that our agricultural users in the CDP system, as well as the fried system and state water project system, are facing anywhere between zero to 20% of their allocations. And MI users that are part of the CDP system are only receiving public health and safety uh, water supply allocations. In other words, minimum allocations to meet uh, minimal public health and safety needs. <clears throat> As a result of us being in the third dry year, uh, one of the things that water users are contending with is limited remaining carryover. In other words, water that was previously stored in the reservoirs has been relatively depleted. And so there's not a lot of carryover that folks can use to manage uh, their supplies and meet their existing demands. And we're also seeing impacts on uh, groundwater levels and groundwater aquifer systems in California. Across the state, and particularly in the Sacramento Valley and San Joaquin Valleys, we're seeing groundwater levels decline which is impacting both pumping costs, which are rising as a result of higher lift costs and energy needs. Uh, and many communities and agricultural users are losing physical access to their well system, uh, which is another uh, major issue to be uh, managed throughout the year. And so as we think about the water market, we're seeing both firmer demands, both from agricultural and municipal users and new Sigma restrictions, which are driving up water costs and also increasing volatility in the market. <clears throat> Now, there's a lot of different ways for water users to manage through these things, uh, and one of the tools that we'll be talking about today is California's new uh, NASDAQ Vela's California Water Index and the associated water futures. And so with that, I'll hand it off to Brian. Great. Thanks, Bryce. Um, as Bryce mentioned, uh, we developed, in starting in 2018, the NASDAQ Vela's California Water Index uh, listed uh, as NQH2O. Uh, so it launched in 2018, but we have uh, pricing data going back to uh, 2013. Uh, so providing some historical transparency as well as uh, real-time transparency on the average price of water in California. So the index is uh, uh, the average price based on several different uh, regions or basins that we track. Um, the index is updated every week uh, based on the volume uh, weight of those transactions. And the prices in these different regions are adjusted for some of the regional variation that we see. So those regions include uh, the Sacramento Valley in the north, uh, the San Joaquin Valley in the south of the Central uh, Valley region, as well as uh, uh, four groundwater basins in Southern California and the Mojave Desert um, that uh, are adjudicated and see uh, frequent trading between them or inside of them, uh, as well as regions that receive water from the State Water Project or the Central Valley Project. Uh, as Bryce mentioned, those allocations for those two uh, project water uh, supplies are been very low over the last couple of years. Um, so there's been a lot of transfer activity. The index um, just over the last few weeks has been setting uh, record prices. Um, but you see in the graph here, uh, the south of Delta region, so the San Joaquin uh, Valley area, uh, has seen prices already rising to uh, $2,000 an acre foot so for some of our recent transfers. And so those prices, along with some of the other regions I mentioned, um, get transformed based on some of that regional variation. Uh, south of Delta uh, water deliveries get price adjusted for transit losses through the Delta. So uh, some water is lost into that system. So there's less volume delivered, which raises the price of that corresponding water. Um, overall though, those regional markets uh, 
all go track in the same direction and magnitude as the overall price index. Uh, what separates this index from others uh, is that it is the true price of water, just as a raw asset. Uh, there are water, other water uh, indexes that you can see uh, on NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, but those uh, typically are a basket of investor owned uh, or publicly owned water utilities or related companies, um, but not, and that index value is tracking the equity value of those companies, not the underlying asset of water itself. So the NQH2O is uh, highly correlated with drought conditions in the state. Uh, as you can see, going back to 2013, uh, the index has jumped in value as uh, drought conditions have taken over the state. That price risk for uh, people on the market is highest when supplies are scarce. Um, and this volatility coincides with that changes uh, in hydrologic volatility. Uh, that, that, However, that sensitivity to these prices in dry or critically dry years, as we're experiencing now, has, has really increased. Uh, you can see in starting in April of 2020, the index uh, jumped in value um, from a little over uh, $300 an acre foot to about $700 an acre foot uh, very quickly as the growing season for agricultural producers began. And uh, that was really before drought conditions took hold in the state. There was uh, low, levels, low levels of drought, but uh, the drought area uh, quickly caught up with the index. But that signals that um, farmers and other market participants were anticipating very dry years and were going out on the market uh, to firm up their own supplies, uh, pricing in the, uh, the scarcity there. Um, that occurred again this spring um, as we saw a very short wet season for California last fall, um, drought still remained, um, but the index value never fell very far uh, as people uh, thought the drought conditions were likely to persist and the index value has only really increased uh, since the spring. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have just seen uh, uh, new records set over the last few weeks. Uh, this week, the index value is just over or just under $1,150 uh, per acre foot um, across, across the state. So the, the focus of this presentation uh, is on the outlook of California's water market, which we've covered with, uh, you know, uh, increasing drought and hydrologic variability, um, firmer demand for agricultural and municipal water supplies, but we've also um, wanted to focus on the innovations here. So NQH2O is uh, a great tool for providing tra price transparency across the state, but um, you know it's not a stock that you can trade in. It doesn't uh, you know it doesn't actually provide water to people. So we wanted to develop um, other tools based on the price index um, that allows people to hedge some of their risk and uh, reduce the risk exposure to the, the changing uh, prices that we see in the index. So we developed um, futures contracts in conjunction with NASDAQ and they are listed on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange with many other commodities. We launched uh, futures contracts as a tool uh, just uh, a little over two years ago or about two years ago, December, 2020. Um, this is similar in many ways to other commodities such as corn or grain, fertilizers, uh, lumber uh, futures, uh, orange juice futures, if you've seen trading places, um, but it is different in one key aspect and that it is uh, financially settled only. So all transactions for futures are cash settled. There is no physical delivery of water. Um, this is for two big reasons. One is that uh, to actually participate in the market for physical delivery, you would need to uh, hold uh, water rights. You would need to be an entitlement holder and that would limit participation. Uh, also is the uh, difficulty in actual physical transfer or physical delivery of that water. While um, you know, there are uh, canals and, and infrastructure across the state, 
it is still very difficult to deliver that water, unlike putting corn or grain on a rail car and moving it, uh, moving it somewhere else. So a contract, uh, each unit is for 10 acre feet. It's measured in, in a, a dollar per acre foot, uh, just the same as NQH2O. Uh, there are uh, contracts available for uh, the current month, uh, the next two months, and then each quarter uh, for eight, eight of the next quarters. Um, you can see in the graph here, so uh, the blue dots represent quotes for uh, what that contract settlement price will be in May, and then the same contract settlement uh, as of July, as of a couple days ago. So for instance, here in September uh, of this year, in May, people thought that that settlement price or the index value would be about $900 an acre foot. Instead, um, now we're seeing uh, those settlement quotes being over $1,000 an acre foot. Uh, already, that's, that's too low because the index value is uh, closer to $1,150 an acre foot. It's, the index is unlikely to go down between now and September. But uh, this, this signals that the market is, in, is anticipating overall increasing scarcity uh, and increasing uh, price premium for available water supplies. So who, who can or who should be using this tool? Um, we've mentioned that agricultural uh, buyers are increasingly um, dominant part of the water market. Um, they are certainly the key players uh, for water futures as they do face the most year-to-year uh, uh, -year price risk for their supplies as they have to go out on the spot market. So we have developed uh, different use cases for different uh, farming entities or uh, farming types. This particular example is for an almond farmer in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, as Bryce mentioned earlier, they uh, almonds are a permanent crop. So you can't fallow your almond um, fields and year to year when uh, it's dry, you need to provide water to it every year. Um, and that has increased overall water demand. But we've also developed use cases for um, annual crops, like row crops, such as tomatoes, um, rice, um, other, other kind of inter-year commodities, as well as uh, for some users in particular situations that uh, have excess supplies that they could put out uh, north of the Delta in particular. But I'll focus on this example. Uh, so an almond farmer, uh, if they're in January, uh, looking, to, uh, looking ahead to the growing season, would, uh, if they wanted to participate in futures, they'd buy a contract in January for $500 an acre foot. Um, and they would uh, settle that contract in June for uh, what is uh, the index value. And the, the index value in June happened to be $858 an acre foot. So uh, someone on the other side of that contract is a speculator or a market maker. And uh, that market maker uh, provided a gain of $358 to Almond Farmer Joe. Um, that $858 is also what the spot market price is for actual physical water. But the gain in the futures allowed them to go out in the market and uh, actually purchase that physical water. So the net purchase price ends up being $500 an acre foot. So uh, while they, they do have to buy the physical water separately, uh, for that, that $850 uh, price, uh, they did gain uh, extra cash available to go out and purchase that. Now, there are uh, uh, other scenarios where the index value does fall. Uh, so in particular here, um, back in 2016, we saw the index value was uh, $500. And uh, almond farmer might uh, think, great, uh, I will purchase a contract um, and this will allow me some extra cash on hand to actually go out and buy physical water to that similar scenario we just talked about. But we saw a historically wet winter over uh, 2016 to 2017 and the index value actually fell. Um, 
in it in June, it settled at two hundred dollars an acre foot. So they the uh, farmer actually uh, lost three hundred dollars, but because the spot market price was only three hundred dollars, they still ended up with only a net purchase price of five hundred dollars an acre foot. So uh, this the, the you know the farmer does face risk that prices could fall, um, but in net, they are still going to pay about $500 an acre foot. So that's that's kind of a one a one time transaction that we just we just demonstrated here. We have looked at how this affects a farmer's uh, net income over a longer term, uh, and so here's uh, 10 years uh, farm budget, um, and this is how water supplies during uh, 10 years of changing hydrologic conditions would affect a farmer's uh, net income. You see the, the gray bars there are dry or critically dry years. So we created this model uh, based on historical hydrologic scenarios and then forecasted that for 10 years and how the dry years would affect that price of water for a farmer on the open market. Again, they need to buy water every year to keep um, their uh, trees, crops uh, healthy, and uh, put a product out on the market. So on average, over that 10 years, um, the, the average income for a hedged, uh, a farmer who's hedging in the market is higher than an unhedged um, uh, farm. So 1.8 million versus 1.7 million. Um, but there are some, there are some downsides to this as well. Uh, we, we see that the the median uh, net income is a little bit lower for a hedger, um, and the max income is lower, but the, min the, the minimum income is also much lower. It's, it's half of that of, uh, that of a farmer who did not hedge uh, in the futures market over that time period. Standard deviation is lower. The coefficient of variation is lower. Um, that measures the ratio of the standard deviation to the average value. And so a lower ratio means that there is less spread of outcomes. There is a less, uh, uh, fewer wider ranging outcomes. Um, this reduces that price risk. This is uh, ultimately showing that uh, a farmer who's hedging their water supply on a year by year basis uh, is minimizing uh, their losses and providing on average a uh, higher income for themselves. Great, so um, just to uh, provide some takeaways here, uh, you know, the, the physical water market uh, is uh, just an important way for water users across the state to, to participate uh, and enhance their flexibility during wet, dry, average, um, uh, critically dry years. Uh, we've seen over the last few years increasing competition, particularly due to um, the increasing uh, dry years uh, in growing firm demand from agricultural users uh, and municipal sources, that increasing municipal and industrial demand is just driving up prices overall um, in pretty much every regional market that we, that we track. There is overall volatility though, uh, for those prices, um, you know, the price sometimes rises faster than um, you'd expect due to that interannual uh, supply volatility. It's uh, becoming more and more challenging for uh, water users to forecast what the price is going to be, which is why we developed NQH2O um, to provide a little bit more price transparency, a greater forecasting tool. Futures are uh, a risk management tool uh, based on NQH2O that assists both buyers and sellers with managing price risk in the market. Uh, and so, we talked about scenarios for an agricultural user to lock in water costs, stabilize their, their net uh, income, and reduce their risk to having to go out of the market uh, and purchase uh, spot market water. This also applies to municipalities, though. Um, in dry years, such as this one, uh, there's often conservation mandates, uh, reducing residential demand, but their supply allocations are cut. So municipal water districts have to go out on the market to purchase additional supplies to uh, provide water to their customers. 
So they have to pay more on the spot market for water while their revenue takes a hit due to declining residential demand. So uh, municipalities can also participate with futures contracts to smooth out that revenue variability and offset any rate surcharges that they may have to pass along to customers, which is uh, really important um, for in particular disadvantaged communities, um, but all customers I think are pretty happy not have to pay those, those rate surcharges um, when, when the spot market price increases. And so with that, um, we're happy to take any questions and uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you guys. That was really interesting and great presentation. So we do have a couple of questions that are already submitted. Um, so the first one is sort of asking you guys to step back and, and look around a little bit. Do you know, or are, do, do there exist or are there in development similar indices like this uh, for other states or, or other regions? Or is the California market sort of the only one that, that is going right now? Yeah, great question. Um, so here in the United States, uh, there's no other publicly listed index um, uh, through NASDAQ or any other uh, index provider um, tracking any other market in the Western US. Um, I think there's been some thought about potentially finding other markets, uh, market regions uh, where an index could be created, but right now California is the only uh, active spot market that's being tracked. Um, and one of the reasons why is that California's uh, water spot market um, is relatively volatile and it's seen the largest volume and largest dollars uh, in terms of uh, in terms of transacted supplies. Um, and so it's a, a great place for uh, good information. Um, and the state is also very interconnected where you have multiple water users participating in the market all the way up from you know, Red Bluff in the north of the state down through San Diego. And because of the interconnections, the conveyance systems, it really makes for a dynamic market with a lot of trading activity which uh, which uh, produces pricing signals uh, that change on a weekly basis. Um, outside of the country, you know, Australia has a very active water market um, where uh, water rights can be purchased and sold. And there are some folks who track that uh, and provide kind of index-like information as well. But in terms of a publicly listed index in the United States, the NQH2O California Water Price Index is the first and only one of its kind. All right, great. And then we have some questions about the physical uh, water market. So what are the limits uh, imposed by water rights on the spot market? And what are some of the issues with considerations of beneficial use? Um, so some of the legal issues involved in, in trading water on the spot market. Um, yeah, so here in California, um, to trade water uh, really depends depends on uh, a number of different compliance considerations. You know, there are, I'll call them intra-water district markets, where within an individual irrigation district, you may have many growers, each of whom gets an allocation for the year, and the district has trading or transferring policies, which allows those growers to transfer amongst themselves. Um, you also have uh, larger inter-district markets where uh, one irrigation district or municipal water agency in one area um, has, we'll call it surplus water, and they are willing to transfer that uh, to a buyer. Um, and to do so, they have to get different approvals, enter into different agreements. They may have to comply with uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. Um, and so depending on what system you're in, what type of water right you hold, uh, the approval processes can vary widely, and that increases transaction costs and can also create uh, some lag time in terms of the ability to consummate and effectuate a transfer. So it really depends on the water right that you hold, what, uh, who the buyer or end uh, or seller is going to be in the, in the, uh, in the transaction. Um, and so it really, it, it really depends on, on regional water right. And then we have a couple of questions about the futures market, activity in the futures market. Um, so what, what volume of trading has the futures market seen already this year? And has there been sufficient interest from growers and hedgers um, to make a liquid market? Yeah, so I don't um, have a complete answer on how much water's um, 
or how many contracts have been traded uh, in the futures market this year uh, overall since the launch of futures uh, in December 2020, uh, we've seen uh, over 15,000 acre feet. Um, and so each each contract is traded um, is is a block of 10 acre feet at a time. Um, I think in the last month we we have seen um, typically five to 10 contracts at a time traded. And I think about 10, uh, 10 transactions. And so the market is fairly small right now for futures. Uh, that is one thing that we are working on is to increase participation, uh, particularly among uh, hedgers who are farmers or uh, people who are otherwise directly um, affected by the physical market uh, that we see. Um, it is it is relatively uh, small right now. Uh, we'd love to see more liquidity in the market um, and more participants. Um, just to that would uh, sort of increase uh, the prices or not increase prices, but increase some of the uh, price transparency and some of the forecasting uh, for futures and NQH two O as well. Okay, and then there are some questions about um, sort of the differences in size between players in this market. So as in any other market where trading is through exchanges, there's a risk of a few big players dominating the market to the detriment of the little guys. How do you ensure confidence in the market that risks such as market power exertion can be mitigated? And as a follow-up to that, uh, is there a risk that, that deep-pocketed municipalities will price out other participants and either skew pricing or even collapse spot and bilateral? Thanks. So I, I think in the physical water market, um, you know, there are uh, numerous participants, both big and small, um, that participate in the market. And uh, California's water market is connected, but it's also hyper localized. And so, um, you know, I like to think about who the market participants can be or are. Uh, there are over 250 Central Valley project contractors. There's 29 separate state water project contractors who have individual subcontractors that work with them and can participate in the market. Um, and you also have over 9 million acres of irrigated land, uh, which is owned by small family farms as well as private entities and institutions. And so there's really a diversity of water market participants. And there are some larger players and there are players who work together, but there are also small folks who participate. And because of the different restrictions and other things, um, it's very difficult for you know one outsized player to significantly influence or exert an oversized influence on the market um, just because of how many different rules there are in each individual irrigation district to participate and move water in the market and because of how um, decentralized all the all the different players are in the market <clears throat> and you have similar concerns about the futures market um not uh not as much. Um, again, it's it's uh, the contracts and uh, futures contracts are uh, financially settled only, and so uh, it would be uh, difficult. Uh, no one is actually transferring physical water uh, based on the futures, so uh, it is harder for someone to come in and buy a large volume of contracts and have that uh, affect physical water supplies. Um, and so. Uh, while we use the term speculators for some people who participate in the futures market, um, that is uh, people who do not have uh, direct physical water. Uh, that does not mean that, that they are actually speculating and hoarding that physical water affecting that uh, spot market price that we see in NQH2O. We very specifically uh, designed um, the futures uh, to not to be financially settled so that it would not um, drive up that uh, spot market price. Um, and then a quick clarifying question. So does Colorado River water factor into the index or is it only water within the state of California? Uh, so the NQH2O index is a California water price index and it's consistent only it consists only of transactions within the state of california selected from uh, major project systems as well as select groundwater basins so it doesn't reflect the water market in colorado uh, or the water market uh, all along the colorado river system among all those states it's a, a california only index 
Um, and do you think that if users were allowed to market across state lines, this is kind of a speculative question, um, would the market grow? Um, not necessarily. You know, water markets are fully constrained by physical conveyance. And so, um, you know, you have to be a part of a river system or you have to be connected by conveyance in order to, you know, buy and sell a water right and move that from one place of beneficial use to another. Um, so there's, you know, relatively few water systems where uh, you would expand the scope or, of the market. Uh, but there are a few, you know, you could think of, for example, the Colorado River is probably the best example. Um, seven major states and water users in each of those individual states rely upon that river system. Um, and right now, interstate trading isn't necessarily permitted, although there have been some unique uh, programs that have been developed in recent years to try and create uh, conserved water. Um, but, you know, water markets, again, are really limited based off of their physical hy hydrology and, uh, and the river systems that the water users are pertinent to. Um, and then another, another question about the, the futures market. Uh, what class of customer is currently participating in the futures market? Yeah, so we are, um, we're seeing uh, mostly agricultural producers uh, and, and irrigation districts um, in the Central Valley. Um, those most affected by the spot market price are uh, the main the main hedgers uh, on that side that, that actually would go out and buy physical water. Um, we do have um, to increase liquid, to provide liquidity in the market, there are market makers. Uh, and those are uh, financial firms that uh, regularly are work with CME, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, um, to purchase contracts and take the opposite position as hedgers uh, to, to provide liquidity. Um, and they, they make money for themselves um, with just uh, kind of the spread of, of contracts uh, the, between the bid and the offer, the offer price. Um, but in terms of the hedgers, it's mostly agricultural producers right now. Um, in the Central Valley, there are some uh, uh, kind of institutional investors um, that own and operate farmland um, that are also participating because they, they do need to hedge um, you know, their own their own water supply risk. And so if you if if you wanted to enter the futures market um, and participate, how, how would you go about doing that? Uh, you would uh, contact a broker's firm. Uh, they would set you up with an account uh, and you would have to fund a minimum uh, in that account. Um, for any, uh, there's an initial margin, and then there's a margin, a minimum margin uh, to provide in that account. So uh, there is, you know, you, you can't just open an account and play around. You you need to uh, actually, you know, have a minimum amount funded. Um, it's not open for retail investors, uh, individual investors. Um, you have to, uh, unless you are a hedger. If you're on the speculator side, um, you. Uh, you need to be some sort of institution in order to participate, but you work with a broker um, and they are the ones that uh, understand uh, the liquidity in the market, the market makers, um, and uh, the, the ability for contracts to be uh, traded. Okay. All right. Um, so I don't see any more questions coming in from the audience. We still have a couple more minutes. So if um, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in there. Um, I have a question about land use change. I mean, I find it counterintuitive that we're seeing um, land use change towards more sort of hardened demand for water in the middle of you know less availability of water. Um, can you? you know, talk a little bit about that and why that, that might be happening. Yeah, gladly. Um, so, I mean, between 20 uh, to, I mean, since about 2000, um, th there's been a significant expansion of permanent crop land, particularly nut crops, uh, almonds being, being the number one 
uh, new crop in the state, as, as well as pistachios now kind of coming up. Uh, there's significant interest in pistachio crops. Um, but, uh, you know, as, as farmers and landowners are seeking to uh, make the highest and best use of their lands, um, you know, frankly, the market offered uh, very attractive returns to a lot of folks. And so that really incentivized the development of permanent crop plantings across California. Um, and those permanent crop plantings afford, you know, larger revenues, which allow folks to make larger capital investments. Um, and we also saw expansion of what I like to call virgin ground development. In other words, uh, developing uh, lands that maybe historically had not been farmed, or at least farmed to irrigated farming. Um, and an expansion of uh, ground uh, cropped in areas that don't have any access to surface water and are wholly reliant upon groundwater. Um, absent the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act or you know, local uh, regulations by counties or local agencies, um, that sort of development has been allowed in, in California. And so uh, again, economics I'd say, as well as uh, you know, few limits on, uh, on land use uh, changes uh, afforded opportunities for folks to develop that sort of cropping. Um, but now we've entered an era in California where, uh, you know, we have uh, allocations and volatility in the surface water system, but we also are starting to see local public agencies develop groundwater trading and allocation systems and extraction limits, uh, which will significantly alter, I think, the, uh, the agricultural landscape in, in California. Yeah, and so what, you, what would you expect going forward in terms of land use change? So I think there are some uh, major projections that have been made, uh, primarily as a result of the overdraft in the Central Valley. Um, there are estimates as high as you know one million acres of irrigated land going out of production uh, to both offset overdraft as well as to manage through the uh, drier climate conditions that we're seeing in California. Um, now that's absent, you know, significant investments in new water supplies and storage and other things. Um, but frankly, there are some. Uh, you know, drastic uh, changes to land use that may occur in California, uh, absent other investments in water supplies and infrastructure. Okay, so what's next for um, for Westwater and the the NQH2O index? What do you guys have on the the horizon? <sighs> Well, thank you for asking that. Well, we're constantly supporting, uh, you know, public, private, and nonprofit clients and managing their water supply challenges. Uh, everything from uh, thinking about new water uh, projects to understanding the water risks of an area. And so uh, we continue to support clients. And I'd say it's probably been uh, very busy over the last couple of years with uh, the continued drought here in California. And with the, the index and NQH2O, we hope to continue to spread the word about these new informational tools, as well as the financial products uh, that can allow water market participants and users to better understand uh, water prices in California and manage the risks associated with uh, with water supply and price volatility. So, uh, you know, we're here to continue to, to spread the word, uh, provide additional information and work with folks in, in managing their water supply challenges. Great. All right. I want to thank you guys both again for a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Um, if you have any final thoughts, um, Bryce or Brian, final words for our audience? I don't think so. No, I just appreciate everybody uh, taking the time to tune in today. Um, the water markets, uh, especially in California, are, are fairly unique. Um, and uh, it's always fun to be able to uh, spread the word a little bit, uh, especially on NQH2O in the futures. So thank you. Yep, just want to echo that. Thank you all for your time. And uh, I think we have our contact information here on the uh, on the final slide. So if you have any follow up questions or any additional interest in Westwater and what we do, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and uh, just thank you again, Lucas and David, for putting together this webinar event. Yep. We really appreciate it.